Only. Carry On Only. Dedicated to inspiring your next global adventure. With award-winning photographer, creative director, and travel expert, Jill Pater. Jill has worked in over 100 countries, has published 21 books on architecture, design, travel, and gastronomy. Now, here's Jill and her co-host, Lisa Polachek. Today, Jill is going to take us to Iceland, what I, from what I understand, a very photogenic country. It absolutely is. How did it get on your radar? It had been on my radar. Actually, everywhere is on my radar. <laughs> but it had, it had been on my radar for a long time. And the nice thing about Iceland is that there's so many flights from the U.S. to Europe that have layover options in Iceland. And so there's lots of opportunity to go as a part of your flight home, if that's, if that's of interest to you. Oh, that's very clever. Yes. Did you have any projects, any publishing projects in mind when d- you were looking at Iceland? I did. I was working on a book at the time called Scandinavian Design, which is coming out this summer, and a book called Modern Refuge, which has been featured on the show quite a few times. A lot of our destinations in that book are on the show, which is great because then we get to show viewers all the latest and greatest places. And in the show notes, you'll see a lot of that photography mm-hmm. as well. What were some of the, the buildings or the scenes that you knew you had to capture while you were there? Well, in, in Reykjavik, the capital, the, there's a beautiful opera house called Harpa, and it's a modern building. It's one of the most beautiful modern buildings, modern opera houses I think I've ever seen. I mean, it's, it's so amazing. So I spent some time photographing that. I did a lot of high-end hospitality shoots, places in and around the Blue Lagoon and in luxury hospitality that kind of take advantage of the natural countryside of mm-hmm. Iceland. And it's on a lot of people's lists right now. And so I'm excited that we're, we're featuring it on the show. Right. Why is it on so many people's lists? What, what are, and what were the things that you were going very well expecting to see? I think it's on so many people's lists just because of really nature lovers. Mm-hmm. It's such a beautiful island. There's so much to see there. People love, you know, what, and what's nice about Iceland is they have tourism so queued up for people coming through. So they're very used to travelers coming for a couple of days, for three night stays, for longer stays. And so it's very easy once you get there to kind of do the exact things you want to do. I mean, mm-hmm. Some of the top, the, probably the most popular things to do are going on Northern Lights tours in the winter, going to the Blue Lagoon, visiting, expediting the South Coast, the glacier trekking. So much to, really so much to do and see. What among those things requires advanced registration? I think to the extent, you know, I, because it is such a popular place and so many tourists are going there, usually kind of for a shorter time frame mm-hmm. and everybody wants to do the same thing. So I, I would say, you know, for those more touristy items, booking as far in advance as you can is, is recommended. And that's very easy to do. Okay. Do you do that from your home in the United States? And, and yes. Okay. Yep. From your home country. Okay. Yes. Is there are there is there an app or a? I would recommend actually starting with the hotel with your accommodations. Oh, okay. So booking your accommodations and then just calling the concierge if they have a concierge or front desk person and asking you know which tours they recommend and which tour companies that typically leave from the hotel because they'll provide transportation to and from that location mm-hmm. and they're the ones that they're most used of dealing with. Okay. What surprises did you encounter along the way? I I just think, you know, being there, exploring the South Coast was so beautiful. People in Iceland are so friendly and so helpful. There was not really like a major, major surprise. I mean, Mm -hmm. a lot of the things we've kind of seen, but I was lucky enough to get out on a Northern Lights tour and see the Northern Lights, Mm -hmm. which was a big bucket list item. So that was great. Um, I think just the the beauty, the natural beauty of the country. I mean, it doesn't matter how many photos you see sometimes of a place, but when you're actually there and you're surrounded by it, it's um, it's pretty profound. Wow. You mentioned the Northern Lights that I believe is a seasonal thing. Yes. Right? And that's more in, um, that would be more in the winter time. But the best time, generally the best time of year to visit Iceland is June through August. Okay. I think I was there in February or March. While you're there, how are you getting around? Is it is it a walkable place? If you're staying in central Reykjavik, the, yep. it, it's walk, walkable. But for a lot of the tours and other things you're going to be doing, you're going to be using transportation, which is usually booked in w- with a tour or hiring a, a taxi and a driver. Okay. And uh, is there any um, distinctive cuisine or uh, is, is food a 
a priority? It is. It, it's quite expensive in oh. Iceland in general, you know, more yeah. than other countries that we've featured on the show. Mm -hmm. It's a little less budget friendly, but definitely amazing food, amazing restaurants. Uh, being an island, of course, seafood, great seafood, great, um, wonderful fish dishes. It is for budget travelers. It can be a bit pricey, mm -hmm. so I recommend, you know, maybe a place where if you are on a tighter budget, going to grocery stores and packing extra snacks and things like that, because sometimes it, it'll surprise you a little bit. If you haven't spent much time in Scandinavia, the prices are, high, you know, quite a bit higher than okay. what we're used to for food. Okay. So it, can you think of any other budget tips or ways to economize as you go? I think there's so many package tours and package things for Iceland yeah. that oftentimes the airlines offer for kind of these layover, these like three to five day trips. Mm -hmm. So I would just keep an eye out for that because mm -hmm. you do have, you know, you have your flight, you have your in-country transportation, and then the things you do, like the say you go to the Blue Lagoon or say you're doing kind of these tours, it's nice if they can be if they're packaged in and you have an, uh, you'll have a greater understanding of what your overall budget's going to be for the trip and that'll help you manage your costs a little bit. Okay. Um, can you tell me a little about the Blue Lagoon? Yes. Uh, so Iceland, there's geothermal lagoons all throughout the country and they're just, they're, most of them are, are publicly accessible. The Blue Lagoon is probably the most famous. Um, so you go and you buy, um, they have transportation to and from most of the hotels in the tourist area. And you go and you can buy a day pass or you can stay overnight there. There's accommodations nearby at a hotel called the Silica Hotel. Mm -hmm. Often people will go there for wellness travel. Like they'll actually go and stay for a couple of days and, you know, enjoy the geothermal lagoon as part of their healing treatments. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the majority of tourists go to the Blue Lagoon. You kind of go in, it's a day pass. So it's just, it's a natural spa. You go in and soak in the waters and you can get massages and all different types of treatments. Uh, so it's a great way to great way to relax. It is one of the busiest and probably most popular. So if you are trying to avoid tourists, I'd recommend just doing a little bit of research on possible other places you could go. Okay. Is Iceland in general a, a comfortable place to travel solo? I know that a lot, of, a lot of times that's your style. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You see people in, you know, you see everybody from families to couples to solo travelers, adventure travelers. It's a very easy place to travel. It's very tourist friendly and it's incredibly safe. Very good. What kind of things are in your suitcase? So depending on the time of year, definitely extra layers. Like that part of the world tends to be a little bit humid, even when it's, when it's cold. I mean, the name ice is in there. Yeah, exactly. It's right in there. Exactly. It's in there. So I always love trying to find the lowest density clothing. So like the lightest packable down jackets. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I, I wear a down jacket in summer, so <laughs> that gives you a little idea. But I, having packable clothing and packable layers. Okay. So scarves, you know, wool, light wool layers. Um, tops and then a uh, packable down jacket I always recommend. Even kind of in the shoulder season, it can get quite cool at night. And then always, we always recommend very comfortable walking shoes. If you're going to hire in restaurants at night, it is, it is going to be dressier. But mm -hmm. I think a lot of people going to Iceland really aren't there for so much the foodie scene. Um, they're, they're really there more for the adventure travel. So you can, you can get away with like a nicely put together outfit at night that's not, you know, black tie attire. Sure. Okay. And do you have any other just general travel tips or, or packing tips? Yeah. Well, one of the things that uh, I know I have quite a few friends who are amazing at putting together, you know, their travel rewards. So keeping track of your mileage on your flights um, and getting great credit card reward programs. So, so many credit card companies now and banks have specific travel cards that mm -hmm. offer no transaction fees on international travel, which is a big thing because those add up. And then they give you points on everything you buy, every single thing you buy. And that can then just be used towards future travel. It's just a great way you can, you know, usually in one year, I can accumulate enough points to book a couple of trips. So it does, it does add up in the end. So that's two surprises that, that I heard when you talked about uh, packaging your excursions I, and that that was a good way to budget and it worked out in your favor. I did not realize that um, packaging them, uh, you know, uh, grouping them would be more affordable. I thought maybe there would be a premium on those. And then also that, that travel rewards on credit cards, like they actually work. You're someone they who's do. making it work. They do. 
excellent. To me, it's like you got to figure out how to speak their language and how to run through the maze. Right. To yeah. Get what you want, but it you works. Know, the things with most travel rules program is they're not, you just have to kind of learn how to use them because obviously they want you to get the credit card, but they don't necessarily want you to, use, you know, they're not as motivated to help you use the points. Uh-huh. So as soon as you learn that system and just are kind of aware of it, you can take advantage of it. Okay. But Chase and Bank of America both have great travel reward credit cards. Oh, great. And, and I have people that just charge everything. I mean, they charge the rent, they charge the utilities, and that all goes toward travel points. All right. Pro tip. Yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, it's been great hearing about Iceland. Thanks for sharing your experience with us. And um, we're going to wrap it up for today, but please do join us again next month for the next episode of Jill Pater's Carry On Only. Carry On Only. Thanks for listening to Carry On Only, dedicated to inspiring your next global adventure. Listen to Jill take you around the world in style, live every week right here or 24-7 on demand at StarWorldWideNetworks.com. Please remember to like, subscribe, and share. For immediate access to Jill's destination guides, blog, and show notes, please visit JillPater.com. And follow her on Instagram at JillPater.